bacteriology. You're going to understand decontamination and all a lot better once we go through bacteriology because we'll know where bacteria are, what they do. Hopefully that decontamination and infection control uh, training that you had the other day will help you some with this. Did you find it a little bit familiar as you read through this? So in order to understand about bacteriology, we first got to have an understanding of bacteria. Bacteria themselves are one-cell microorganisms with both plant and animal characteristics. We've heard them called germs or microbes. We know now that they can exist almost anywhere on the skin, in water, air, decayed matter, secretions of body openings, in clo on clothing, and beneath the nails. We can't see them, and we're a people that kind of don't get concerned about things unless we can see it, do we? We don't think about what's out there in the air. But they can only be seen with the aid of a microscope. 1,500 rod-shaped bacteria will fit comfortably on the head of a pen. That's scary, isn't it? There are hundreds of different kinds of bacteria. However, bacteria are classified into two main types, depending on whether they are beneficial or harmful. Most bacteria are non-pathogenic organisms, meaning that they are either helpful or, at worst, harmless. They're not disease-producing. They perform many useful functions, such as decomposing garbage and improving soil fertility. You know of all these people that, and I don't even know what they call it, they fix a bin in their backyards and dump all the grass clippings and they water it and sometimes they put the cut vegetables or something out of the house on it. It begins to decompose and then they use it next year as fertilizer around their flower beds or whatever. And that's what they're talking about here. In the human body, non-pathogenic bacteria actually help metabolize food, protect us against infectious microorganisms, and help to stimulate our immune responses. Some bacteria cultures are used to produce penicillin, acidophilus yogurt, and a special type of milk used for gastrointestinal disorders. Saprophytes is a type of non-pathogenic bacteria and it lives on dead matter. And that's what breaks down that fertilizer pile. Pathogenic is what we're going to concentrate on in this lecture though because that's the um, microbes or germs that are harmful. And although they're in the minority, they cause disease when they invade plant and animal tissue. To this group belong the parasites, which require living matter for their growth. Now, I don't want you to get parasites and saprophytes mixed up. Saprophytes live on dead matter. And, you know, once we cut the grass, that grass clippings are dead. It was living one time and grew. But parasites has to have something like us to live off of. Mistletoe is a parasite. You don't ever see a mistletoe bush growing. You see mistletoe, and when you go out at break, you look across the road, and there's piles of it in those trees. All the leaves are off the trees, but there sits the mistletoe up on it. And it's a parasite. It takes its nourishment and all from that living tree. Lice do us the same way. Lice have got to have us to live off of. So don't mix up your saprophytes and parasites. The classifications of pathogenic bacteria... Bacteria have distinct shapes that help to identify them. Pathogenic bacteria are classified as coxy. These are round-shaped bacteria that appear singly or in the following groups. And doctors can tell by looking at how, they're, how they appear to know what diseases and all you have or what type of bacterial infection you have. Staphylococci are pus-forming bacteria that grow in clusters like a bunch of grapes. They cause abscesses, pustules, and boils. And one way I remember this, and this can occur, but luckily it doesn't happen much, is the staff at the hospital does not disinfect or does not sterilize the equipment. And you go in and you have surgery with implements that are not sterile. And you get an incision wherever they cut you. And then a few weeks later, you'll have this big boil to come up in the side, your side or somewhere else. It's usually not in the incision. And it's where you've got staphylococci infection. And it'll begin to boil pus out of it. And that's why it's called a boil. And that is where you were infected with 
with staph infection. So the, the, the reason I say that, staph and staph lecoxy helps me to keep them connected. Streptococci are also pus-forming bacteria that are arranged in curved lines resembling a string of beads. They cause infections such as strep throat and blood poisoning. Diplococci are spherical bacteria that grow in pairs and cause diseases such as pneumonia. Look at the name Coxy too and you'll remember because it's just about totally round, C-O-C-C-I, you know, and you remember they're round. Bacilla are short rod-shaped bacteria, and if you notice the last part of bacilla, it's about all rods, the I-L-L-I. -L -L -I. They are the most common bacteria and produce diseases such as tetanus, typhoid fever, tuberculosis, and diphtheria. And then spirilla is certainly not one to, hard to remember the shape, spiral, and spirilla almost says that. So they are spiral or corkscrew shaped. They are divided into subgroups. They cause syphilis, which is a sexually transmitted disease, and Lyme disease. Movement of bacteria. Y'all know that I ask you to sanitize everything in here. In the next unit we're going to have, we're going to talk about the difference of me saying sterilize, disinfect, or sanitize. And that, that's different levels of what we get rid of. And it's according to what we use an implement for as to whether we sanitize, disinfect, or sterilize. And when I ask y'all to clean the tables and chairs and windows and all in here, all we're doing is sanitizing. But sanitizing does get rid of some bacteria. Different bacteria move in different ways. Coxy rarely show active motility or self-movement. However, they are transmitted in the air, in dust, or within the substance in which they settle. So we know that they're out here moving around and we want to clean some of them up and hopefully kill some of them or retard the growth of them. Bacilla and spirilla are both modal and use slender hair-like extensions known as flagella, singular, or cilia for locomotion or moving about. A whip-like motion of these hairs moves the bacteria in liquid. We also have some hair-like extensions on our face. The technical term for them are cilia. Do y'all like to take a guess at what they are? Hair-like projections. A whip-like motion of these hairs moves the bacteria and liquid. And believe it or not, cilia, which is the technical term for our eyelashes, also helps to keep bacteria and all out of our eyes. So that's one of the functions they serve. I want to go over these terms on page 96 with you before we move on so that we know what we're really talking about, a little review. Bacteria are one-cell microorganisms with both plant and animal characteristics. Some are harmful, some harmless. They may also be called microbes and germs. Bacteriology is the science that deals with the study of these microorganisms. Infectious, and I'm going to say uh, infectious, communicable, and contagious are going to be all used interchangeably, but they mean the, basically the same thing. So infectious means it's communicable by infection from one person to another or from one infected body part to another. And from one person to another is why we're concerned with bacteria because if we've got a client that's got something, we don't care for it, do we? And we're, we're not wanting our share of it. And if we've got it, we don't want to be putting it on our clients either. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't want to spread from client to client. And we do have the capability of doing that under certain circumstances. Microbes or germs are synonyms for disease-producing bacteria. Microbiology is the science that deals with microorganisms and their effects on the other forms of life. Microorganism is a microscopic plant or animal cell. Ology is the suffix meaning scientific study of. Parasite is a vegetable or animal organism that lives on or in another organism and draws its nourishment from that organism. Toxin is any of various poison su poisonous substances produced by some microorganisms. 
virology is the study of viruses and viral disease. And virus is a submicroscopic structure capable of infesting all, almost all plants and animals, including bacteria. Infectious agent that lives only by penetrating cells and becoming part of them. The difference in virus and bacteria, and y'all probably know this already, but in case you don't, bacteria can live on these tables and grow and reproduce right there on the floor where it gets damp or dirty or whatever. A virus has got to attach itself to some other cell in order to live. It can't just live out here on its own. Also, we don't have a lot of medications to do anything with viruses. Viruses, that's when they say it's got to run its course. You go to the doctor and you've got this terrible stomach virus, you know, and thinking the doctor can cure you up, but that stomach virus is going to run its course. He might give you something to make you a little more comfortable. <coughs> Bacterial growth and reproduction. Bacteria generally consists of an outer cell wall and internal protoplasm. They manufacture their own food from the surrounding environment. They give off waste products and they grow and reproduce. They don't sound that much different from us, do they? We, you know, get our food from our surrounding environments. We mind to. We can get out there and grow our own vegetables and things. We give off waste products, and we also are capable of growing and reproducing. The life cycle of bacteria is made up of two distinct phases, the active or vegetative stage and the inactive or spore-forming stage. During the active stage, bacteria grow and reproduce. These microorganisms mu multiply best in warm, dark, damp, or dirty places where sufficient food is available. The reason we're really concerned about that, we have a lot of dampness in the beauty shop. We know that we're going to have a lot of water, and set and lotions, and all that sort of thing. So we want to dry up all of our spills wherever they are and keep things as dry as possible. Watch our wet towels because we can't run wash a load of towels every time we mess up three. You know, so we've got them sitting there just a prime place for bacteria to grow. Dirty places, that's why we concentrate on sanitation and cleaning everything. And warm, we have a lot of areas in the salon that are warm. We've got blow dryers going and curling irons going and hooded dryers going. And our cabinets also is dark. Where we put our dirty towels is in a cabinet and it's dark in there. The towels themselves are damp. So that's why it's necessary that we go gather the towels every hour or two to get them out of there and get them, get them laundered. When conditions are favorable, bacteria grow and reproduce. When they reach their largest size, they divide into two new cells. This division is called mitosis. The cells that are formed are called daughter cells. When conditions are unfavorable, bacteria die or become inactive. How fast do you think these cells grow and reproduce or grow and split into two daughter cells that then splits into four daughter cells that then splits into... How fast do you think that occurs? By the seconds. Probably less than that. One bacteria can grow and reproduce into 160,000 in a half a day. Now do you know why we want to clean up behind each client, clean the counter and all that? Well, we don't know what that client brought in there. As a matter of fact, we don't know what we brought in that morning either. The inactive or spore forming stage. Now I want you to pay particular attention here because this is the part that gives us problems with sanitation and disinfection. Certain bacteria, such as the anthrax and tetanus bacilli, form spherical spores with tough outer coverings during their inactive stage. The purpose is to be able to withstand periods of famine, dryness, and unsuitable temperatures. In this stage, spores can be blown about and are not harmed by disinfectants. They're not harmed by disinfectants. Heat or cold. When favorable conditions are restored, the spores change back into the active or vegetative form, then grow and reproduce. Let me tell you a good example of that. We go to the doctor and we've got a bacterial infection, and he gives us 10 days of antibiotics. 
and we take the antibiotics just like we're supposed to and we get to feeling much better. But in about 10, 15 days, we come down again with the same thing, except now we're sicker. And what happened is some of those bacteria were in the spore-forming stage, and even that antibiotic could not enter that tough outer covering so that the antibiotics could kill them. Now, as far as us in here cleaning <coughs> or cleaning our implements or whatever, when we clean them and then disinfect them, a disinfectant will not kill bacteria that are in the spore forming stage. There's only one thing that will kill bacteria in the spore forming stage and that is sterilization and we can only sterilize by boiling or baking. You know, you'll see when you if you watch any of these medical programs on TV where they have the instruments in the operating room and this oven like thing, boiling thing. Well our implements can't be boiled anyway, unless you're talking about our hair cutting shears or cuticle nippers or something. What's going to happen if we tried to boil our combs and brushes and all that we use? We can, or bake them. We're going to go back and we're just going to have a blob of plastic left there. So it's vitally important. Spore forming is what keeps us every day and behind every client. Because after a while, he, this, this one that's in the spore forming stage is going to pop back to life and we're just right there ready to splat him with that disinfectant when he does before they can grow and reproduce. When favorable conditions are restored, the spores change into the active or vegetative stage and begin to grow and reproduce again. Bacterial infections. An infection occurs when body tissues are invaded by disease-causing or pathogenic bacteria. There can be no bacterial infection without the presence of pathogenic bacteria. The presence of pus is a sign of infection. Pus is a fluid product of inflammation and contains white blood cells and the debris of dead cells, tissue elements, and bacteria. So pus is a giving us a sign, don't handle that without gloves. Even if it's not seeping pus, if there, we can see pus, then we know we don't want to be putting our hands on it. Staphylococci are among the most common human bacteria and they're carried by about a third of the population. Staph can be picked up on doorknobs, countertops, and other surface surfaces, but is more frequently transferred through skin-to-skin -skin contact, such as shaking hands or using unclean implements. Unclean implements. Antibiotics once control these bacteria, but certain strains of staph are now resistant to the drugs. There is now a greater need than ever for proper use of infection control measures in the cosmetology industry because of these resistant bacteria. Some people will have a bacteria infection where they just have little bumps all over with, and they, they don't start out with them all over like you get the chicken pox or anything. They start out with one or two, and then it spreads to one or two, and if you're handling it, then you're going to wind up with it. They're, they're really hard to um, control. A local infection, such as a pimple or abscess, is one that is confined to a particular part of the body and is indicated by a lesion containing pus. That means it's in one area only. We can see it. It's local. A general infection results when the bloodstream carries the bacteria or virus along with their toxins or poisons to all parts of the body. Syphilis is an example. Did y'all realize syphilis goes all over the body? Syphilis will cause your nails to fall off. It'll cause blindness in the latter stages. So it's a really serious thing. When a disease spreads from one ter person to another by contact, it is said to be contagious or communicable. And I say it's infectious too. Some of the more common contagious diseases that will prevent a cosmetologist from servicing a client are tuberculosis, common cold, ringworm, scabies, and viral infections. You remember the physician certificate I give you to have filled out? That's what I'm looking for. If you got it, I'm not going to, you know condemn you. I want you to get it treated so you can come in and work. The chief sources of contagion are unclean hand and, hands and implements, 
open sores, pus, mouth and nose discharges, and shared drinking cups and towels. Uncovered coughing or sneezing and spitting in public also spread germs. I am a big Braves fan. I want to go ahead and tell you all that. When the Braves start playing, I have to watch it. I'll come in here half asleep some days after they've played if the mm -hmm. game's a good game. But how in the world they don't all fall dead with something, them along with the other teams, because every time you look, they're spitting everywhere. I don't see how they walk in the dugout. And y'all watch a few minutes of the games this year of one of them and watch. Every 30 seconds they're spitting. You know, and what are they spitting out? Germs. And Yeah, it's probably tobacco and uh, sunflower seeds and all that. But there's something else coming out of there too. All right, let's go over our terms and definitions. An acute disease is a disease having a rapid onset, severe symptoms, but it has a short course or duration, so it doesn't last long. An allergy is a reaction due to extreme sensitivity to certain foods, chemicals, or other normally harm harmless substances. In several of our units, we're going to study about allergies where people have allergic reactions to some of our products. And naturally, we're not going to be using those products on those people, but we have tests that we actually do on our clients to ascertain whether they're allergic to it or not. A chronic disease is a disease of long duration, usually mild but recurring. A lot of our skin diseases are that way, such as psoriasis. It'll seem to go away and then pops back out, and it seems to go away, and then there it is again. Congenital disease is a disease that exists at birth. Contagious disease is a disease that is communicable or transmittable by contact. Contraindication is any condition or disease that makes an indicated treatment or medication inadvisable. Diagnosis is the determination of the nature of a disease from its symptoms. Disease is an abnormal condition of all or part of the body, organ, or mind that makes it incapable of carrying on normal function. Epidemic is the appearance of a disease that simultaneously attacks a large number of persons living in a particular locality. Etiology is the study of the causes of disease and their mode of operation. Infectious disease is a disease caused by pathogenic microorganisms or viruses that are easily spread. Inflammation is a condition of some part of the body as a protective response to injury, irritation, or infection. It's characterized by redness, heat, pain, and swelling. Objective symptoms are symptoms that are visible, such as pimples, pustules, or inflammation. Occupational disease is illness resulting from conditions associated with employment such as coming in contact with certain chemicals or tents. That's why we always need to be careful about our sanitation, about wearing gloves when we work with chemicals because we get dermatitis. I love jewelry, especially rings, and I've always worn a good many rings. When I was new into this profession, I did everything without gloves and I got dermatitis. And so there went my rings, because all under them is where it'll start. I don't know what set it off a couple of years ago, but I'm back to that again. Now if I wear one for very long, I have to pull them off unless I wear something really thin. So it's aggravating, and once you get something like that, it has a, you know, it recurs. So the reason I'm telling you this is because when you know you're working with chemicals, glove up. Don't handle the chemicals. A lot of them say, well, it does, it's not hurting my fingers or anything, but it really is, even though you don't feel it. Over time, eventually, it's going to get you. <coughs> Parasitic disease is a disease caused by vegetable or animal parasites such as pediculosis and ringworm. Pediculosis is an infection of lice, in case you're wondering. Pathogenic disease is a disease produced by disease-causing bacteria such as Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, which is a pus-forming bacteria, or even viruses. 
Pathology is the science that investigates modifications of the functions and changes in structure caused by disease. Prognosis <coughs> is the foretelling of the probable course of a disease. Seasonal disease is disease influenced by the weather. Subjective symptoms are symptoms that can be felt, such as itching, burning, or pain. And sometimes if we, people can't see something on us, they don't think we're really hurting. I know when I was a lot younger, I'd hear people complain with their back and complain with their back, and I'd think, you know, they don't seem like anything's wrong with them. I think they're just complaining to be <laughs> complaining. But then I had my little go-round of the back pain, and let me tell you, <laughs> it's not just complaining. But again, something we can't see, we have a tendency to kind of push it aside as non-important. Systemic disease is a disease that affects the body generally, often due to under or over-functioning of some of our internal glands. Venereal disease is a contagious disease commonly acquired by contact with an infected person during sexual intercourse. It's characterized by sores and rashes on the skin. Then we want to talk about our viruses. A virus is a submicroscopic structure capable of infesting almost all plants and animals, including bacteria. They are so small that they can even pass through the pores of a porcelain filter. In that case, they're called filterable viruses. They cause common colds and other respiratory and gastrointestinal or digestive tract infections. Other viruses that plague humans are measles, mumps, chicken pox, smallpox, rabies, yellow fever, hepatitis, polio, influenza, and HIV, which causes AIDS. One difference between viruses and bacteria is that a virus lives only by penetrating cells and becoming a part of them, while bacteria are organisms that can live on their own. It is for this reason that bacterial infections can usually be treated with specific antibiotics, while viruses are hard to kill without harming the body in the process. Viruses are resistant to antibiotics. There is some vaccinations to prevent some viruses from penetrating cells, but vaccinations are not available for all viruses. Hepatitis, a disease marked by inflammation of the liver, is caused by a blood-borne virus similar to HIV in transmission. It's more easily contracted than HIV as it is present in all body fluids. You know, they say HIV is not in the saliva and all, but hepatitis is. Three different types of hepatitis that are concerned to us are hepatitis A, which usually lasts about three weeks. Symptoms are similar to those of the flu. Adults often have yellowing of the skin or the eyes. The disease is spread through close household contact, such as common bathroom use, poor sanitation, poor public, excuse me, poor sanitation, poor personal hygiene, contaminated food, milk, water, and shellfish, infected food handlers, and through sexual contact. A vaccine is available. Hepatitis B or HBV is an illness that can cause long-term hepatitis, cirrhosis, and or liver cancer. About half the people with the disease do not have symptoms, although the disease can mirror the flu. The disease is primarily transferred through sexual contact or parenteral exposure, meaning piercing mucous membranes or skin barrier to blood or blood products. A vaccine is available. I think Ms. Uh, Sapp probably talked to y'all the other day about the vaccine and it it'd be a wise move to get one you knew into the career because although we're not in the profession of drawing blood sometimes we do draw blood whether we mean to or not we do nip a cuticle that we shouldn't we do get an ear that we shouldn't all along hepatitis C or HCV the illness can progress slowly and about one third of those with the illness do not have symptoms those symptoms can include fatigue and stomach pain the disease is transferred through parenteral contact and sexual activity with infected partners. No vaccine is available. And sometimes people have hepatitis B for 20 and 30 years before they know they have it. 
So think about how many people we can spread it to or they can spread it to, you know, and never know that they have the disease. There's also another hepatitis that we're not all that concerned with because in order to get hepatitis D, you have to already have hepatitis B. So it's kind of one of those that kicks you when you're down. You got hepatitis B, so it decides it'll jump on you too. HIV and AIDS. HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, is the virus that causes AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. AIDS, the disease, breaks down the body's immune system. HIV is passed from person to person through blood or other body fluids such as semen and vaginal secretions. A person can be infected with HIV for up to 11 years without having symptoms. Imagine how many people they can infect in that length of time. Sometimes people who are HIV positive have never been tested and do not know they are infecting other people. That is the reason it doesn't matter whether it's our mother, our brother, our sister, our best friend. When we see any opening in the skin or anything, we handle it with gloves. Because you might say, that's my mom or that's my best friend. I know they couldn't have it. But could they? Yes. So you want to always protect yourself. You treat all of your clients as if they have HIV or hepatitis B, and you keep yourself safe. The HIV virus is transmitted through unprotected sexual contact, the sharing of needles by intravenous drug users, and accidents with needles in healthcare settings. Can enter the bloodstream through cuts and sores and can be transmitted in the salon by sharp implement. It is not transmitted by holding hands, hugging, kissing, sharing food or household items like the telephone or even toilet seats. There are no documented cases of the virus being transmitted by food handlers insects or ca casual contacts. <clears throat> so now we need to talk about how pathogens enter our body because we need to know how they get in so we'll know how to protect ourselves from them. Pathogenic bacteria or viruses can enter the body through a break in the skin such as a cut, pimple, or scratch. Let me tell you something about working with hair. When we cut hair Sometimes hairs will stick in our finger. Is that a break in the skin? That is a break in the skin. Bristles from the brush will often stick in our skin. We get so accustomed to it, we don't even pay any attention to it. So you might say, well, I know I haven't had anything to happen because I could have failed it. But you, you don't. That becomes so much a part of it. I've had little pimples come up in the palm of my hands or the ends of my thumbs. And when I was younger and not as wise to things in the bottom of my feet and we get down and get to looking under a bright light and it's where a piece of hair was stuck in there and was causing a sore was that necessarily my hair no. probably wasn't my hair no pull it out and all so I know I had that break pathogenic bacteria viruses can enter the body through the mouth such as contaminated water or food also through the nose by the air we breathe in, the eyes or ears, and by unprotected sex. Luckily for us, the body fights infection by means of unbroken skin, which is the body's first line of defense against bacteria and viruses. It also fights infection by means of body secretion, secretion such as perspiration and digestive juices. Getting, when we sweat, we're getting rid of toxins that are in the body. Also fights infection with the white blood cells within the blood that destroy bacteria once they've entered the body. Also antitoxins that counteract the toxins produced by bacteria and viruses. Then we have our blood-borne pathogens. Disease-causing bacteria or viruses that are carried through, bod through the body in the blood or body fluids, such as hepatitis and HIV, are called blood-borne pathogens. If you accidentally cut a client who is HIV positive or is infected with hepatitis and you continue to use the implement without cleaning and disinfecting it, you risk puncturing your skin or cutting another client with a contaminated tool. Similarly, if you are shaving a client's face or neck with a razor or clipper blades and pick up body fluids from a blemish or open sore, transmission is possible. 
risk are also present when waxing or tweezing. When some people get their eyebrows tweezed, when you pull out a hair, you'll see a little droplet of blood come up. You know, so you're at risk of handling that. And when people sometimes have a little sore on their neck and we're cleaning it up after a short haircut, those clipper blades will often clip that and you'll see a little blood droplet come up. So that again is a source of contagion. Parasites are vegetable or animal organisms that live in or on another living organism and they draw that nourishment from that organism. That organism is then referred to as the host. They are not capable of sustaining their own life without a host. Vegetable or plant parasites or fungi, which include moles, mildews, and yeast, can produce contagious diseases, such as ringworm or favus, which are both skin diseases. Nail fungus can be contracted through implements that have not been disinfected properly or by moisture trapped under nail enhancements. They're really on the nails now, and CNN had a special the other night, and I've been wanting to go out on the website and bring it up for you and show you. But a lot of these shops, for whatever reason, and, and I know what the reason is, is I can't afford to buy 20 drills or files, whatever they use on the electric ones, or the attachments for them, because they're a little bit pricey. So some of my clients are getting smarter to sanitation because it's on the news and it's in magazines and all that. So what I do, I don't have time to clean and disinfect it because most things that have to be disinfected, you leave it in the solution or in contact with the disinfectant for 20 minutes. So what they're doing, it is going and brushing it off or wiping it off and putting it in a plastic bag and putting it in the drawer so when the next client comes in, they get it out. And we feel like that it's done properly. But we need to watch a little more than it coming out of a little plastic bag. You know, we need to make sure it was clean when it went in that plastic bag or disinfected. Being clean is not good enough. Nail fungus is chronic and usually localized but can spread to other nails and from client to client if implements are not disinfected before and after each client. Treatment is generally applied directly to the affected area. In serious cases, however, a physician's care is required. Now I want to go back to something, and it's not in your book, but you might want to write it down and tell you some ways that um, disease is also transmitted, and that's through the human disease carrier. Now y'all remember hearing about a typhoid Mary back in history? Nobody heard about typhoid Mary? Y'all heard of typhoid fever? Typhoid fever would go through the western towns, you know, like during the gold rush and all that, and it would just about wipe out an entire town. And luckily there was people that could come and help care for them, and for whatever reason, they never got the disease. Some of them were probably immune to it, had had a slight case of it and it made them immune. Others, however, the reason they didn't get it, they were the ones that were spreading it. Mm -hmm. They were human disease carrier, and a human disease carrier is a person who never has the disease themselves but they carry the germ of it and spread it to other people. And that is often the case with typhoid fever and diphtheria. Now you know why Typhoid Mary had her name. She went from town to town helping with it, but she was one of the main things that was spreading it. Animal parasites such as head lice are responsible for contagious diseases and conditions. A skin disease caused by an infestation of head lice is called pediculosis capitis. You want to remember that word capitis because that's often going to tell us where uh, an infection is. And when it's capitis, that means it's of the head. Scabies is another contagious skin disease and is caused by the itch mite which burrows under the skin. We were almost away from having scabies in the United States, but now as people travel more abroad, um, Mexico, they say, is real bad for it, and it's in the mattresses in the hotel rooms. And um, what it does is the itch might get under the skin, and then it'll lay an egg and move on up, move on up, and it's, it's called itch mite because it just drives you wild itching. There is treatment for it, and make sure you get treatment because it's contagious. 
Contagious diseases and conditions caused by parasites should never be treated in the school or salon. And I can't remember if it was this group or another group asked me um, today, what did we do, or did I ever had I ever had anybody with lice? Found them with lice. And it was almost a terror when I worked at night there for a while as they'd go through the schools and people would use the, um, us at night to cut the children's hair, you know, because they'd be in school during the daytime, that you would have somebody to come and you'd get the child's hair sectioned off. And we finally learned to just look for it a lot um, to see if they had lice. But if we're halfway through with the haircut, we've got to quit. Then we can no longer work on them because the more we work, the more we're scattering the hair and the lice and the counter and the comb and the, all this. And when they would leave, we'd get them out. They'd leave everybody in here with them. <laughs> and, and running around, some of them wanting to pour barbicide on their hands, which is not going to help any. This is a disinfectant. It's not made for lice. But... um. You make sure that you don't work on somebody that has that, so you certainly don't try to treat it. They can go to Walmart and buy treatment over the counter that works quite well. But the problem and the reason we keep having the lice and having the lice is we don't read on on our directions, or the parents do not, to where it says they must be treated again in X number of days according to what they're using. And they don't uh, wash their jackets and their bed clothes and vacuum up and do away with the the bag in the vacuum, wherever they may be, you know, under the bed or in the carpet or wherever else. So that's why they keep spreading it. Clients should be referred to a physician. Contaminated countertops should be cleaned with a pesticide or insecticide according to manufacturer's directions. Then we have immunity, and we are so lucky that we have immunity. And that's what happens with HIV or AIDS. It actually eats up our immune system so that we're not not able to fight off diseases. But immunity itself is the ability of the body to destroy any bacteria that have gained entrance and to resist infection in general. Immunity against disease can be natural or acquired and is a sign of good health. Natural immunity is partly inherited and partly developed through hygienic living. Acquired immunity is immunity that the body develops after it overcomes a disease, and that's such as measles and mumps, you've had it, so now you're immune to it, or through inoculation, such as the vaccinations we can get. Two or three years ago, Georgia finally passed this law or rule that we must use hospital-grade disinfectants. Hospital-grade disinfectants kills more bacteria than just regular disinfectants that we used to use. And we have to use them now, and it's got all these kind of long names, and we'll go over that when we get into our next unit. But we want a tuberculocidal, biocidal, all that. And we want to make sure that's what's on our bottles so that we're getting rid of all that stuff we think we're getting rid of. Do we have questions?